recording now. So for those of you that are new to this process, um, Federation Jewish Men's Club have been doing many different types now of webinars from Yiddish to genealogy to sports uh, to cooking. So uh, this really started because uh, we're all, many of us have been home, even those of us that aren't home. Um, we've been do zooming, 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 and it's been really, really fantastic and very successful. Uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, I'm gonna do a little more advertising, and I wanna put a thought to everybody that's on this call. We're looking to someone to lead one of these to do latkes because Hanukkah is next month. So if you are so inclined, um, we're, we're looking for someone to lead the charge. So without any further ado, Renee, take it over. It's all yours. Well, uh, welcome to our home and welcome to my kitchen. Usually I, I get the kitchen. My wife has the rest of the house. So uh, this is kind of my domain. Um, I've uh, been teaching for 30 years. So, uh, I am uh, a uh, professor in chef's clothing, uh, but uh, I still keep uh, busy in the industry and do various events on occasion through the association that I'm uh, with. Uh, uh, so Renee, actually, before I have you go on, I did forget one, one very important thing. Yeah. Uh, the way we do these webinars is we're not going to have you ask questions. We're going to have you work through the chat. And then I will filter those questions through to our chef. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free, uh, no rush, and I will filter them through. Okay, through the chat line. Thanks. And those questions can come in throughout the demonstration if you happen to see something um, that you have a question about. How long do you want this on for? So we're going to. A, uh, a chicken marsala with the rice pilaf, and I'm going to do the rice pilaf first uh, because I can allow the rice to sit for a period of time. It'll stay nice and hot, uh, and it'll actually continue to stay uh, for the presentation. Uh, I just happen to want to show you is. Uh, the rice that I have is uh, this basmati, and what I did was I washed this twice uh, for a couple minutes to get all the kind of the cloudiness out of the water, uh, and then I allow this to sit in a strainer. Uh, and I like to do this so uh, far in advance. Um, however, if I'm pressed for time, the amount of uh, time I usually have for uh, preparing this is about 15 minutes before I start cooking the rice. Uh, and the reason for this is I like the rice to kind of dry uh, so it's not so wet when I add it to the pot with the onions. Uh, so the sauteing of this uh, will coat the rice with the oil and then it'll um, be a really nice fluffy pilaf. Uh, so what I'm using is uh, basmati rice. Uh, you can use jasmine, you can use white rice, you can use converted rice. Uh, the recipe that you have, the preparation, is pretty much the same for whatever rice that you are preparing. Uh, the exceptions are, uh, as you go in, add more water because it's a denser rice. And wild rice uh, is about a three to one ratio for every cup of water or broth or stock that you're using. You're going to probably need about three cups uh, for every cup of rice, uh, three cups of water or broth. Um, so I, I have this rice here already dried and ready to go. Uh, and then I have my onion, uh, whole onion. I'm not going to use all of this, uh, but I just want to demonstrate how thin and how small the cut is. Uh, and just before I start, I happen to like cutting boards with any kind of mat or uh, rubber bottom and if i don't have that i generally put some kind of uh, a shelf liner uh, a thick grade shelf liner and i'll show you that when i do the chicken uh the type of liner that i use but the reason i do this is if i were to just put this cutting board let's say this is the cutting surface if i put this on the table this is going to start sliding uh and then i'm not going to have a lot of control so that's why i like a board that has any kind of 
uh, rubber footing, uh, or I can put a wet towel underneath, it'll do the same thing. Okay, so I'm gonna just take my onion, I'm gonna cut this in half. Renee, we have a question. Can okay. you use a brown basmati rice tray? Yes. For a brown basmati, uh, it will be the same uh, ratio that uh, you have in your recipe. It's uh, almost a two to one ratio. But the brown bas basmati, all that uh, really means is they didn't remove the husk or the outer bran portion of the rice. Uh, so it didn't get polished like a white rice does. Uh, white rice generally has the outer uh, bran removed and then it gets polished and it becomes white. But brown basmati, same ratio, same type of cooking process. So I have this onion, I cut it in half and I cut through the core. Uh, and the reason for this is because I want this onion to hold together. I don't cut the onion, the round part of it. I always cut through the core so the core holds on uh, while I'm cutting. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some very, very thin slices into this onion. Uh, uh, literally about a sixteenth of an inch is the width of each slice that I'm cutting through. Kind of like this. And so if I were to hold up this onion, it's still going to hold together. Uh, and then I'll just make a series of cuts. My slices are kind of separating here. Uh, and I'm going to turn this perpendicular, make some cuts again. And this is about all that I need, about two tablespoons. And I'll just mince this up a little bit to make it a little bit finer. However, the way that the onion is cut, or the way that I cut the onion, uh, because uh, if there's a layer in between each um, layer of onion, this is going to naturally fall apart when it's sauteing. So I'll just set this aside. This is, as I said, this is about two tablespoons for my preparation. So I'm gonna just go over, bring all these things over to the stove and I'm just gonna start the preparation. All right, so I have uh, my ingredients. I have uh, this uh, awesome consomme, and I actually like this when I'm making the uh, rice pilaf. I don't add salt to the water. I'm not making a chicken stock broth. Uh, this happens to be parav, so it has applications for uh, any kind of dish that you want. This happens to be a meat pot, so uh, this is gonna stay meat. Uh, but the fact that this is uh, a part of product, uh, I don't have to worry about if I'm using our jerry pro um, pots, then I can still use this powder. Uh, so I get my pot nice and hot uh, and then add some olive oil. I'm only going to add olive oil to cover the bottom of the pan and you can kind of see it swirling around there. And I'll just add the onions in that to start the sauteing process. And I happen to have an electric range here. Uh, it's about a medium heat that I'm using to uh, cook the rice. I, uh, it goes up to nine. Uh, and I brought the temperature down to about a six and a half. I'll start the cooking process. And then as I continue to add the liquid, I will slowly reduce the, uh, the temperature down. I've gone, I'm going from probably about a 6.5 on the uh, range to somewhere up between a 2.6 and a 2.8. Um, and that was a license for two kids. Great. Take about 15 minutes from the time that the onions go in to the time that uh, I finish the uh, cooking of the rice. So we have the onions sauteing. 
And all I want to have happen is that they turn to be a nice translucent. Uh, so I don't want them completely cooked because they're going to continue to cook in the product. And so I don't know if you can hear very well the sizzling of the uh, rice, but it's starting to saute and cook. So that takes about a minute or two, and then I'm just gonna dump the entire amount of rice into the pot. And what I want to have happen now is I wanna coat the rice with the oil that's in the pot, uh, and I wanna mix the onions with the rice as well. So, all we're doing is just making sure that the rice is well coated. So what I'm going to do right now is add about two teaspoons of the powder. And I happen to like adding the powder to the dry rice because I like to mix that up a little bit. And I'm going to tell you if you have your, whether it be gas or electric, you might feel some of the rice stick to the bottom of the pot, which is perfectly fine because as soon as I add the liquid, uh, it's all going to come off the uh, bottom of the pot. So, Renee, we have a uh, question from the audience okay. um, about your use of olive oil. And the question is, one of our previous cooks has said not to use olive oil for sauteing. Instead, they said to use canola oil. What's your opinion? Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of canola oil at all. And I'll explain that in a second. So I have one cup of water, which I'm gonna add to this. And that first cup, I'm just going to um, kind of, Stir everything together, and then I'm going to pour that seventh eighth of a cup of water. The more water you add, the stickier the rice is going to be um, later on. The less water that you add, the uh, more defined the grains are going to be. So I've known people who will cook basmati rice with about a a cup and a half of water, <laughs> see some very, very fine grains. So while this is cooking, I'll answer that uh, canola versus olive oil question. Um, canola oil comes from the rapeseed. Actually, it was uh, developed and uh, uh, refined in Canada, hence the name canola oil, uh, Canadian oil. Uh, and rapeseed is a really beautiful yellow plant. Uh, if you ever drive in Canada in the growing season, it's just like a whole field of this uh, wonderful looking plant. Uh, the only thing that I'll mention, which is one of the reasons why I stay away from canola, is uh, the rapeseed was part of what in World War I we used for mustard gas. It was one of the ingredients. It's not to say that the actual rapeseed will be the same kind of effects as the uh, mustard gas that they used in World War I. However, um, I just have a preference to other kinds of oils. What is um, this topic? Canola. What is the topic? Uh, I would uh, rather use- Federation of Jewish uh, Men's Club doing Indian recipe. So, why do I use uh, olive oil? It doesn't, the amount that I'm using is so little that it doesn't impart a lot of flavor of the olive in the uh, dish itself. Um, but I love sauteing with uh, olive oil. It's a little bit more healthful. Uh, canola oil being processed the way it is, the more you process any product, uh, the less healthful benefits it has. So if we have vegetable oil, like just corn oil, um, that's actually by itself more helpful than uh, some of the other oils that are uh, vegetable oils, which you can have soybean and 
uh, canola and corn and, and so on. So I just have a preference to the olive. So as I'm cooking this uh, rice, what I'm looking to have happen is for the rice to start to reduce down to the point where I see little craters inside the liquid, the reducing liquid. Those little volcanoes or craters is uh, actually the appearance that I know that I've had the reduction that's going to give me the, the proper cooking. So I turn my temperature down to about 2.5 and I'm just gonna cover this and allow this to continue to cook for probably another 10 minutes. So now while this is cooking, I'll go over to do the chicken. Okay. Little adjustment here as we turn this around. So I mentioned, sorry, no, first I'm gonna do the chicken. Um, so I mentioned I have like these uh, board baits or shelf baits. Uh, this is a nice rubbery uh, surface and I have my cutting board and uh, in our house, uh, we use one cutting board for chicken only. Uh, and I designated our blue board for um, doing the any poultry product. So um, we always get this uh, cutting board. I have a bunch of other cutting boards, wooden and white uh, plastic. But the way we know our poultry board is by the fact that it happens to be a, a blue board. So Renee, while you're, before you're doing that, I have a couple of uh, things okay. here on the chat. Number one, one of our regional presidents agrees with you and says that olive oil is also healthier than the canola oil. So to that. Um, and we have a question from one of our other regional presidents. He would like to know what type of cookware, which is actually an interesting question since I worked for Sir Latab for two years, what type of cookware are you using? Uh, well, the small pot that we uh, uh, cook the rice in is a, uh, actually was my wife's pot. Uh, it is a revereware that doesn't have the copper lining. It's a very heavy gauge, uh, small sauce pot. Uh, I will tell you that the pan that I'm using to saute the chicken uh, is a relatively new type of pan. It's called a black cube, a uh, black, uh, it's on the bottom. But the, the treatment of the pan itself uh, is a nonstick surface. You can use this for uh, literally any cooking uh, preparation, and you can actually put a scratch pad to this. Uh, when my wife and I got married, we happened to get Cafalon as our, uh, sorry as our uh, cookware for our dairy and meat products. So we have Cafalon that we still use for cooking um, meat and dairy. But I've, I happen to like a lot of restaurant equipment. Uh, I'm very familiar with Sir Latab, and uh, I go to restaurant supply stores to buy a lot of my cookware. Uh, so that, that's kind of my uh, perspective on that. Don't be too familiar anymore, because... Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, the other thing that I do is I will use a boning knife to do the chicken. Uh, and a boning knife, in comparison to a French knife or a chef's knife, um, is a longer, a uh, little bit stiffer blade, and it allows me to do the preparation that uh, I can work closer to the chicken with. However, I can still do the same thing with this French knife or cook's knife that I can do with a boning knife, but I happen to like this. So I have my chicken breast here, and uh, this uh, chicken here has a tenderloin in it. So I'm gonna just remove the tenderloin. And this little strip can be used for um, 
chicken fingers or other applications. Uh, I could also put it into the uh, chicken marsala. But I want to trim this so that I don't have any uh, fat showing because I don't want any of that in my dish as I have a finished product. And any of the uh, kind of small blood vessels that may remain are all going to be uh, removed as well. So I'm going to just trim that off. And this happens to be Empire chicken. And you just never know what you're going to get with Empire. Uh, this happens to have a little bit more blood vessel than I'm used to. So what I want to do is I'm going to cut this in one long half piece. Uh, and so I insert my knife towards where it would be the thicker part. And I'm just going to kind of cut this in half. All the way down. So I have two portions. I'll do that with the next one as well. Again, this has a larger tender. And the tenderloin has a little bit of um, a piece of connective tissue, uh, actually like a, a muscle, that all I have to do is like scrape my knife against the bottom of the board to remove that. And then I have a clean tender. Okay, so I'll do the same thing with this, removing any of the pieces that have some sinew or muscles still attached. And remove all the fat, the excess fat on the outside. And you'll notice that I'm, I keep moving the chicken around because it's, uh, I want my knife to do the work and I want to be able to see what I'm doing. Okay, so again, I'm going to just take this piece and I'm just going to go uh, across halfway through uh, all the way to make a nice long piece. And the reason I do this is particularly with these empire chicken breasts, they happen to be very, very thick. And I can get actually two nice portions out of this um, for a service that um, you wouldn't really know the difference between one really thick piece and one uh, piece that's not as thick. Uh, the other thing that I did want to show you is you don't necessarily have to do that. I'm going to remove this tender again. pieces. So um, occasionally what we've done is uh, for like a, um, if you need to prepare food for a shiva, I very often will do chicken marsala but rather than doing the whole breast, uh, I'll take the chicken and I'll cut it into strips. So this breast, and I'm not sure how well you can see this on camera, has a grain that's running in this direction, like this. So when I cut this, I want to be ma making sure that I cut across the grain. Uh, and I'll just show you what I mean by this uh, as I'm doing this. And actually, this applies to Thanksgiving. So imagine this is my turkey breast uh, sitting on the turkey. Uh, most people will take the turkey and they'll slice it right off the whole bone. And what that does is you're running with the grain of the turkey. What is the better way to do it is take that whole breast off and then slice your pieces of turkey breast crossways. So I'm going to do that same thing with this just to show you what I mean. I see the grain that's running in this direction. And so I just take my pieces and they end up being like about a half inch piece in thickness for my pieces. 
if I were going to do this for, let's say, a, a Shiva meal for a family, um, or even if I have a large number of people coming over for a Shabbat dinner, uh, and I'm preparing more than just uh, one protein item, so I'm doing uh, chicken and I'm doing, let's say, a <coughs> beef item or something else, um, because I always want to have whatever the people want available. Uh, so I'm just going to take this away and put this in the sink. So um, going to, oh, the other thing that I just wanted to kind of mention is <clears throat> you can pound the chicken breast. Um, this is a uh, institutional meat mallet. Um, I got this from Thor. He wasn't filming for uh, the, uh, any movie recently, so I got this off of him. But what this allows me to do is uh, pound the chicken breast to make it as thin as the uh, actual um, end or tail piece of the chicken. So I would start on this really coarse end here. Uh, then I would turn it to this slightly less coarse end and then I would finish out on the flat end. Uh, and when I use this mallet, I always cover my uh, product, whether it be chicken or veal, with uh, film, generally uh, two layers of film as I'm cutting. So I have my chicken ready. Uh, I am going to do my mushrooms, and this is about six ounces of mushrooms. I have two different types. I happen to be uh, at the grocery store. I bought some baby Bella mushrooms and some moonlight or white mushrooms. So I'm going to cut those as well. And for these larger mushrooms, I can cut them in half and just kind of cut them about three eighths of an inch. For the smaller Bella mushrooms, I can leave those whole. And when I'm slicing, as I try to tell my students, my fingers are perpendicular to the knife so that I'm not going to lose any digits because I want to keep them for the next day. So I'll just continue to slice these. And if it is difficult to slice these on the rounded end, you can take a mushroom. This happens to be a big one. Just cut it in half so you have a flat base. Uh, this gives you like a working area that it won't rock around so much. So I'll just continue to slice that on its base so it doesn't go anywhere. The question is, do you wash your mushrooms? I've already washed the mushrooms, um, particularly now with the fact that uh, E. coli is one of the microorganisms that we have to be worried about. Uh, I have seen mushroom brushes and I don't use a mushroom brush particularly because uh, you may not get all the dirt out. I will tell you that those mushrooms go through ultraviolet light. Uh, it, it should kill any organism, but most people don't like seeing the brown color uh, of the dirt in the mushroom itself. So I wash my mushrooms. I make sure that I generally dry them in a colander or with paper towels so that they're nice and dry. Um, but yes, the, to answer your question, I do um, wash my mushrooms. I have a few more questions for you while we have a little break here. Do you recommend using the scrapes for tasting in soups or stews? Do I recommend which? Using the scrapes, the scraps, for oh, tasting in soup or, or stew. Uh, you could. The only problem with that is um, it is so... Like when I make stock, I will um, use bones and I will take the meat off the bones to add to my matzo ball soup, for example. Um, but if you take the little pieces of chicken uh, like this, and I put this in the stock, it's going to cook so quickly by the time my soup uh, has developed the flavor with the bones, 
the chicken would not be, um, it, it wouldn't have much flavor. It's going to lose most of its flavor in the cooking process. Uh, uh, well, that's a good, great segue to another question. How thin should the breast meat be? Uh, probably about three eighths of an inch thin. Uh, if I were to pound that whole breast uh, with a mallet, uh, it's going to make a really large like chicken schnitzel uh, uh, size because it's going to spread out onto the cutting board. Uh, so it should be about three eighths of an inch, not paper thin. Uh, if it was really, really thin like a schnitzel, uh, it's going to cook very quickly uh, in the preparation. So you want to make sure that that's uh, not too thin. And just let me wash my hands a little bit because I just touched the chicken, so I have to do that again. So the only other thing left to uh, kind of prepare in advance is the uh, garlic. Uh, I happen to uh, like using whole garlic to make my own chopped garlic. Uh, you can buy already pre-chopped garlic. I, uh, I prefer not using it personally because it doesn't have the same flavor as fresh. Uh, garlic I always store at room temperature. I never put it in the refrigerator. Uh, if you happen to refrigerate it, it changes its property. Uh, it will become a little less harsh, but it won't have the full flavor of the garlic. And the way I usually do for a calculation is uh, one clove of garlic is about one teaspoon. So uh, I know that the outside cloves of the garlic are generally bigger than the inside, but kind of as a rule of thumb is I figure that for every piece of garlic, it is about one teaspoon. So first I just uh, slice this garlic and then I can kind of chop this up. I'm always kind of gathering this together. So I get it nice and small. And there are uh, chefs on wooden cutting boards that used to salt their boards. Uh, they would sprinkle salt on top of the cutting board when they're chopping garlic so that the uh, juices of the garlic didn't go into the pores of the cutting board, but all that really did was make garlic saltier. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of people would add salt to it, particularly like a kosher salt, and it would make it easier to chop, but for me, I don't have any problem chopping without salt or any other product in there. So I have my chopped garlic going into my dish. I'm just going to, I believe, turn off my stove or the rice. And um, just mentioning a little bit about the garlic itself. Um, if you cook whole garlic, it's going to be a lot sweeter than sliced garlic. And sliced garlic is going to be a lot sweeter than chopped garlic. And if you, you happen to like using a garlic press, uh, a garlic press will make the harshest um, kind of resulting product from the garlic. And if you're gonna put it through a press, I would uh, only co cook that or saute that very, very quickly. Uh, when it's chopped fresh like this, I can allow this to cook to release the flavors and it won't turn bitter. But pressed garlic through a garlic press, I have found just from experience in cooking, it often is uh, a little bit more bitter than something that you're chopping by hand. And we have a question on the garlic. Do you store the garlic in a special container or just in a bowl? Uh, I actually store my garlic with the onions that we have uh, at home. Uh, so it's not in a special container. Uh, it's not in anything uh, that's different than, uh, you know, where I keep our onions and our potatoes. Uh, but they're in a separate closet than all our other kinds of food products. So I'm just going to add the uh, 
uh, make this season flour. And uh, it's a like a three to one ratio to, of salt to white pepper. Uh, I am using white pepper for this because if I were to use like a black pepper, it's gonna show up in the chicken breast. And for me, it's not as appealing as having the white pepper that kind of loses itself into the flour. Uh, so I'll just add this and then I'll, when I do the chicken later, I'll just mix this in. And the only other ingredient that I have besides the, the chicken, the mushrooms, the garlic, and the flour is the uh, stock. Uh, this is a uh, stock that I make at home. Uh, I go to our local butcher, I buy bones uh, every now and then just to make sure that we have enough, and particularly during the winter time. I always have frozen uh, chicken stock in the refrigerator or in the freezer. Uh, so this is six ounces of um, chicken stock, and I'm using Kedem uh, Marcella. Uh, and the thing that I actually like about Kedem is it's a sweeter Marcella than uh, an Italian type. You can buy sweet and dry uh, Italian Marcella. But I actually, uh, and actually my daughter is the one who really likes the Marcella when I use this. Um, they, it, it just has a really nice flavor. It, it's not uh, what people would think would be an inferior product. So I'm just gonna add another six ounces of this. So I have 12 ounces total of my stock and broth. And if I don't use all of this in my uh, cooking process, I just refrigerate this and I use this uh, later for some other application. So I'm gonna go over to the stove and get things together. Okay. So because I'm uh, going to be working with the chicken again, I'm going to just put the gloves on while I get my pan nice and hot. No other uh, questions coming up on chat? Or that, is that gonna come as we go? I will mention, uh, kind of while I'm doing this, uh, this application of chicken marsala has a lot of other um, applications. It's not just marsala. Uh, for example, you could do chicken piccata uh, and instead of uh, doing the uh, chicken and the mushrooms, I would do chicken, some white wine, some slices of lemon and capers, and it's the exact same recipe as the chicken marsala. Uh, or I could uh, do something like a, a chicken chasseur, which is a French dish. And I would do the chicken, some tomatoes and mushrooms. And instead of a chicken stock, I would add a brown sauce. So it'd be a nice, uh, like brown dish. Uh, so this recipe is kind of like a base recipe for uh, a lot of other chicken applications that uh, you could do chicken and artichoke, for example, with a little bit of lemon and use a white wine and not use Marcella wine. So um, it's, it's something that's really adaptable and uh, has more than one application. So I'm going to add uh, enough olive oil to cover the, the pan. So it's about an eighth inch layer. Um, mixing up my salt and white pepper. And as I said, this is like a seasoned flour. So I'm going to add my chicken breast to this, flour this a little bit. If I were to flour this chicken breast ahead of time and allow this to sit while I was doing some other cooking preparation or advanced work, what would happen is the chicken would absorb all the flour and it would become really, you, you wouldn't even see the flour on it. Uh, so it would become somewhat 
um, a little pasty. Uh, so I would have to reflower the chicken so I'm going to have a nice brown color uh, when I do this uh, sauteing of, of the chicken breast. Okay, so I'm just going to bring my chicken closer to the pan. I'm going to lay this in. And when I lay it in the pan, I'm always laying the breast away from me so that it doesn't splatter on my coat or splatters on me. How hot is the pan? Um, this is about a medium high heat. And I've allowed the, uh, the olive oil to get nice and hot. Uh, I want to at least smell the fragrance of the uh, olive. And I'm just going to add a little bit of flour in this because this is going to kind of be a little bit of a thickening agent like a roux uh, for my liquid when I add the uh, stock later. So when I cook this chicken, I want to not keep turning it, checking it every time to see how brown it gets. I want to allow this to cook on its one side until it gets to the color that I want. Every time I pick up the chicken and turn it, uh, it actually toughens the uh, sinew or the, uh, the actual protein of the chicken or veal or beef. Uh, when I cook a hamburger, I only uh, cook a hamburger on a grill on one side, and then I allow that to cook for its time, and then I turn it over, and I never turn it over again to keep um, you know, checking it. So um, I do the same thing with any kind of meat protein that I'm working with. I only want to turn it once. Uh, and the side that I put down is the presentation side, so hopefully I won't have to turn it again on the plate when I uh, serve it later. So I might take a look underneath just to see how it's browning. And I want a nice light tan color for this. And I don't know how well you can see in the camera, but it's sauteing really well. Uh, so I'm just going to turn this and it's a nice light brownish color, some tan in there. And as soon as I turn this over, I'm gonna add my mushrooms. And I'm just gonna lay the mushrooms on top to kind of start that steaming and cooking process. Uh, I don't mix up the mushrooms with the uh, kind of chicken because I want that side of the chicken to kind of get done, to, to have some uh, cooking going on as well. And the other thing is I'm not going to add my garlic right away because as I said, chopped garlic has a tendency to be a little bit bitter uh, and you only want to cook it till you are get the aroma or the fragrance of the garlic. Once you've gotten that, you need to add your liquid or whatever is the next step uh, to kind of stop the cooking process of that garlic. So I'm just gonna make a little kind of hole in the center, add that garlic to the pan, give this a little shake to allow that to saute. And I'm waiting for the fragrance of that garlic to be noticeable, which I'm starting to get. And this is about the point where I'm going to add my Marcel and stock. And I'm gonna allow this to kind of start to simmer a little bit. If I were doing a Shabbat dinner, um, I would at this point, once it comes to the boil, I would put this into like a casserole dish or a pan and I would uh, put it in the oven, probably about 300 degrees. I could cover it 
and allow it to cook for another 15 or 20 minutes or to put it down to about 200 degrees and I can hold it at that temperature uh, until people are coming over for Shabbat dinner. Um, but it's, it's at this point where this chicken is ready for like a, a large group of people to hold. Uh, this is also a dish that you can do literally in like within 45 minutes uh, or an hour, including the rice. And once this has come to the boil, this chicken is ready. Uh, it's ready, one, because it's so thin. And if it were the whole chicken breast, I'd probably cook it for another five minutes or so. So I'm just going to turn this off. I'm going to get my rice here. So as I mentioned, I uh, like to leave the rice covered for uh, until I'm ready for the application. It steamed really nice. And all I do is I'll take my fork and I'll just kind of fluff this up with the fork. Get my plate. And I'll take a portion of the rice that I'm gonna put on the plate. Making a nice bed, a little bit more. Then my two chicken pieces. Just make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And then cover it with some of the sauce. Set this to the side for a sec. And serve this with some asparagus that I cooked a little bit earlier. And this is the uh, chicken marsala. So the only other thing that I just wanted to kind of explain or show is the asparagus that I have. Um, how do I know how big or long the piece of asparagus should be? So this is a fresh piece of asparagus that hasn't been cooked yet. Uh, and what I do is I'll take the asparagus and bend it. And where it breaks, where it separates from the bottom, is the tender part of the asparagus. So this would be the part I would cook. So I just take this piece, literally bend this. This would be the tender part of the asparagus. The bottom part of the asparagus I could use for like a cream of asparagus soup, or um, I could actually make a, uh, a puree of asparagus, like an artichoke dip by cooking it this asparagus slightly, um, pureeing this, and then making like an as asparagus dip. Uh, but the uh, difference is this is all tender. This has its tendency to be a little bit tough and takes a little bit longer to cook, uh, which is why I separate the two uh, for my chicken marsala. So here we go. Uh, I'm sorry that none of you will be able to eat this. My wife and I are gonna have a late dinner so uh well we do have some comments it well, looks very delicious great class thank you well, very well, educational well. class and we do have a very good question you used the ketum before but do you suggest any wine to go with your um well the interesting part of this uh chicken generally has um a tendency to be linked to white wine uh but the fact that we use Marsala uh, means that you could actually serve this with a red or a white wine. So if I were going to do uh, this chicken dish with white wine, I'd use uh, a Chenin Blanc, a Chablis, a uh, Chardonnay, 
uh, but I would not do something like a Moscato, which is a very sweet wine. It would definitely uh, affect the flavor of the Marsala. So a lighter type of wine that doesn't compete with the Marsala. Uh, if I were going to do um, a um, red wine with this, I'd probably do like a Pinot Noir um, or a Gamay. Uh, so those two reds are not competing with this particular uh, chicken dish. Uh, but the fact that Marsala is a darker wine, uh, it, it lends itself with either one. Uh, however, if you want to take the uh, neutral stance, uh, champagne goes with all foods. <laughs> you could serve champagne with this and you wouldn't have to worry. Excellent. Excellent. That's a very good answer. Very good answer. Uh, our president, Thomas Sudo, suggests Jezreel White. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So, Renee, um, <clears throat> first of all, that was... Uh, probably no doubt our most professional and uh, thorough class that we've had in all of these uh, webinars. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas Sudo, our president for baking the shit up, making the connection. Um, it really was, uh, I mean, your, your outfit just set the tone to begin with. So, um, and it does really look good. So uh, be a nice late dinner for you. Um, I'm getting many, many comments of how informative and professional that your uh, presentation was. And we had a terrific uh, turnout with almost 50 participants tonight wow. so uh, throughout North America. So uh, we will send you a wine on the vine. We will plant a... Uh, oh, great. Yeah, I've been doing that for the last many months, which is uh, a, a nice token of our appreciation from the Federation of Jewish Men's Club. And for those of you on the call, if this is the first one you are participating on, we will continue to have these on a regular basis. As I said in the beginning of the presentation, we are looking for someone to do a Lockheed's uh, presentation. Um, so if you're so inclined, please contact me uh, at dmando at fjmc.org. Uh, or you can just call me at 617-771-1834. And we'd love to have you. And if you don't want to do Lockheed's and are interested in leading one of these, we would love to have you. You can pick your food. We've, we've had everything, uh, all kinds of uh, dishes from all kinds of, from Chinese to um, uh, all, over, all over the globe. So it would be great if, uh, if you are interested. So someone did ask for where they could get the recipes. We did send them out. So um, if you, it's on your email. If you do not have it, uh, contact me uh, personally and I will be happy, happy to send you the recipe. And that's it. So Renee, you cooked the whole meal within the hour, which was great. So yeshikach to you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see everyone again uh, in a couple of weeks with our next, hopefully our next uh, Lockheed's uh, webinar. Yosha Koach, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Renee, thank, it's Tom. Thank you very, very much. This is wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank that you. was great. Yeah. I'm, was. De I'm debating running over to try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a little to go box. <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, Renee. Great job. Thanks.